Welcome to Transformations. This is our first episode and uh, I want to welcome everybody who's diving in and hopefully looking for a little bit of a break from whether it's a brain break for something you're working on on this fine day or if you're trying to relax and wind down and go to sleep perhaps. Hopefully this will benefit you while providing some mundane but um, interesting nonetheless types of information. The focus is uh, I go around my O-Gage model train layouts and select just different random things and focus on them and provide some facts about them and background. So you'll notice uh, chugging along there's steam engines and my Maryland Mark commuter train on this particular layout along with some points of interest everything from Elvis's Graceland to volcanoes and dinosaurs and the Grinch's Mount Crumpet but nope this time we're going to focus on the Ferris wheel so let's dig in shall we the original Ferris wheel sometimes referred to as the Chicago wheel was designed and built by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. and was the centerpiece of the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, Illinois. It was intended as an attraction in the same manner as the 1889 Paris Exposition's Eiffel Tower. The Ferris wheel was the Columbian Exposition's tallest attraction, with a height of 264 feet. Ferris wheel was dismantled and then rebuilt in Lincoln Park, Chicago in 1895 and then dismantled and rebuilt a third and final time for the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri. And then it was ultimately demolished in 1906. As far as the design and construction of that Ferris wheel, it was designed and constructed by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. And he was a graduate of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He hailed from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and was a bridge builder. He'd begun his career in the railroad industry, for those of you who are real or toy train fans, and then pursued an interest in bridge building. He understood the growing need for structural steel, no surprise being from Pittsburgh, and founded the GWG Ferris and Company in Pittsburgh. And that was a firm that tested and inspected metals for railroads and bridge builders. Dynamite was used to break through three feet of frozen ground to create the foundation for the wheel in Chicago. During the construction of the wheel in Jackson Park, during the winter of 1892 to 1893, and jets of steam were used by workers to thaw the dirt and prevent the poured concrete from freezing. Piles of timber were driven 32 feet into the ground, on top of which were laid a grillage of steel filled with concrete. The wheel rotated on a 71-ton, 45-and-a-half-foot-long axle, comprising what was at the time the world's largest hollow forging, manufactured in Pittsburgh by the Bethlehem Iron Company. It weighed nearly 90,000 pounds, together with two 16-foot diameter cast iron spiders, which weighed 53,031 pounds. There were 36 passenger cars, each fitted with 40 revolving chairs and able to accommodate up to 60 people, giving a total capacity of 2,160. On June 9, 1893, the wheel was primed for a test run with great anticipation and a good deal of anxiety. The engine that would activate the wheel was fueled by steam boilers whose underground mains rushed steam to propel the pistons of its thousand horsepower engines. Upon first seeing the wheel, which towered over everything in its vicinity, Julian Hawthorne, son of the author Nathaniel, was amazed that anything of such size could, quote, continue to keep itself erect. It is no visible means of support, none that appear adequate. The spokes look like cobwebs. They are after the fashion of those on the newest make of bicycles. Both Ferris and his associates recognized the engineering marvel the wheel represented as a giant wheel that would turn slowly and smoothly without structural failure 
and that had never been attempted. For its inaugural run, no cars had yet been attached. The workmen, however, climbed the structure and settled themselves on the spokes to the accompaniment of cheers from an audience of fair employees who had gathered to watch the momentous event. After the wheel had completed its first rotation, it was deemed a success. Ferris himself had not been able to attend the launching of his invention, and that evening received a telegram. Quote, the last coupling and final adjustment was made, and steam turned on at six o'clock this evening. One complete rotation of the big wheel was made. Everything worked satisfactory. Twenty minutes' time was taken for the revolution. I congratulate you upon its complete success. Midway is wildly enthusiastic. The Ferris wheel took 20 minutes to make two revolutions. The first involved six stops to allow passengers to exit and enter, and the second a nine-minute non-stop rotation for which ticket holders paid 50 cents. As an aside related to Ferris wheels, I don't know if you're a fan or not, or maybe you are or not. don't know what your thought is about heights or fear of heights or Ferris wheels in general. I was just thinking, I uh, those that are kind of permanent structures, uh, like the wheel that's uh, on the pier in Chicago and, and similar, the London Eye and other large permanent Ferris wheels, versus those that you might find at, say, a county fair, where I'm always a bit uneasy when it's uh, something that uh, is really put together and taken down in relatively short order and couple of inspector stickers slapped on them but what do you think put something in the comments if you're a, a fan of ferris wheels or or even o gauge or whatever might pop into your head if you feel the urge to comment but um, i just recall some childhood memories when you ride a ferris wheel at the county fair and you'd look up and it seemed like there was always one rusty bolt keeping the car uh, attached to the uh, structure and uh, I don't know whether you're actually taking your life in your hands every time you rode that thing, but it's always a little bit unsettling. Anyway, let's dig in a little bit about the uh, the Columbian Exposition itself, because for rail fans out there, or, or model railroaders, or just people who like additional interesting facts, I'll dig in a bit more. But really, the the fair itself had opened in May and ran through October 30th, 1893 that year with 46 nations participating in the fair. And it was the first World's Fair to have national pavilions. Of the attractions, uh, as I was saying, for those of you who are into O-gauge trains or toy trains or just interesting information, the John Bull locomotive was on display, and it was only 62 years old at the time, having been built in 1831. And it was the first locomotive acquisition by the Smithsonian Institution. It ran under its own power from Washington, D.C. to Chicago to participate in the World's Fair and then returned to Washington under its own power again when the exposition closed. More recently, in 1981, it was the oldest surviving operable steam locomotive in the world when it ran under its own power again. Additionally, at the Columbian Exposition, was a Baldwin, which is a, a steam locomotive manufacturer at the time, 242 locomotive, which was also showcased and subsequently was known as the Columbia. Interesting enough for those who aren't really familiar with why a steam locomotive might be referred to as a 242, it's really the wheel or, or truck configuration. So that means there are two of the littler wheels in the front followed by four of the bigger wheels, so two on each side, and then an additional smaller two wheels in the back. So just a interesting or I find interesting fact. So that does it for the um, information related to the Ferris wheel and beyond. I hope you will join me for future transformations. I might come up with something called locomotivations too. We'll see. But for now, I appreciate you joining. I hope you have a relaxing rest of your day or evening. We'll catch you soon.